And so let's start with a slide. Uh, we have a minute taker and uh, Jabber LA, it's Jonathan Hoyland. Many thanks, Jonathan. Uh, if you want to say something in Jabber, please use these commands. Uh, the minute and blue sheets will be available uh, uh, by this link in CodeMD. It's instead of Etherpad platform. Uh, please add your name one more time. And this is a link to the web. This is not, the not well. I think nothing new for everyone. Just look at it if you haven't read them. This privacy and code conduct and the links to the RFCs. And the link to the RFC about IRTF primer. So our agenda and slides are published uh, in the data tracker. The agenda is there. So let's start with the uh, document status. Uh, so we uh, haven't obtained any new RFCs since our virtual meeting in April. Uh, we don't have any new RFCs in the RFC editor queue. Uh, but we have a good update on random, uh, randomness improvements document. Now it's uh, in ISG review. Uh, the author believes believe that all IRSG commands have been addressed, and so now it's in conflict review, in ASG review, uh, etc. So we hope that it might be ready before Bangkok <laughs> or virtual in November. Uh, we have an update of Argon2, so the authors addressed uh, all the concerns that were expressed. Uh, now we're waiting for our reviewers to confirm that uh, all their concerns have been addressed, and then uh, it, the IRSG review will continue. Uh, about active CFRG drafts, first of all, SPAKE 2 uh, will have a presentation from Watson um, just after this presentation. Uh, we have new shepherd of the document, it's me, and uh, I think that uh, we'll proceed with this document. Uh, we have a lot of uh, good reviews of it because it was involved in the pack uh, selection process. So a lot of uh, commands, a lot of pros and cons of all solutions have been expressed. So I think that um, it's in a good shape. And uh, after a few updates, in my opinion, the document should be ready for further steps. Uh, we have an uh, updated version of hashtag curve document, and uh, it's in a very good condition, and uh, in my opinion, we'll be able to proceed with this really soon. We have uh, VRF updated, and uh, we have Kangaroo 12, which is unchanged, but the search group last call ended, and we asked for another two panel review, uh, because there was, were not too many opinions about it the document, so uh, we'll ask for one more review. Uh, we have uh, the OPRF updated, and uh, uh, today there will be a presentation about the OPRF, so all news about this. Uh, we have uh, a research group last call on HPK. It started in May, uh, so please express your opinion if you want to. Uh, we don't have any changes with BLS signature, uh, we have a lot of changes about parent friendly curves, and we started a uh, research group last call about one month ago, but uh, we have received new opinions, uh, especially from Rene, and uh, I believe that the authors would like to address these uh, concerns. Uh, so, the Restretto uh, is now a work item of um, CFRG, it has been updated, so the work is going on. About the related work, uh, we have some hope that uh, we'll have some news about um, post-quantum document because Nick Sullivan um, started to be involved in the process, so maybe we'll have some news about this uh, before the next meeting. Uh, we still have some discussions about 
uh, draft of John Madsen's about deterministic signatures. Um, so the process is going on. Uh, we have a new uh, related item um, for AED limits. Uh, Chris Wood will um, have uh, 10 minutes to discuss this document uh, today. Uh, and we have two documents uh, that are about uh, PEC uh, protocols that were selected during PEC selection process. So it is OPEC um, and the draft uh, by Phil Kravchik with uh, Chris Wood and with, uh, with the help of Julia Hesse uh, is available. It has been recently updated and uh, in the near future it will be adopted as a uh, safer G item after uh, the updated version with uh, draft IRTF safer G names uh, name will be obtained. The same thing is with uh, draft about CPAs. Uh, we have Bjorn Haas, uh, Julia Haas, uh, and today Michelle Abdallah uh, joined the team. Uh, he has a lot of uh, very important. Uh, Comments about security, and uh, uh, we believe that his involvement will will also help to um, make the draft as good as possible. And we have some expired drafts, uh, but if to um, say about its structure, uh, in fact, it needs to be updated, and we think that it's ready for the third plus call. Uh, so that's about document status and about crypto panel. So everybody knows the history that it was formed in uh, 2016. We have a wiki page and uh, now uh, we have um, a lot of documents going through this panel. Uh, a lot of good reviews done and extremely good reviews were done during the uh, pet selection process. Many thanks again for all reviewers. And also currently we try to ask uh, for reviews from crypto panel for every document that is ready or um, we think that it's ready for a search group last call. Uh, and our current members is on the slide. So thanks to everyone in the review panel for their involvement. Uh, the reviews are really good and we think that it's really helpful for CFRG to have uh, good opinions. Uh, so any other business? Please say your name and say something you know, if you want to bash an agenda or say any other stuff. If not, then we have a presentation from Watson Lab. Please, Watson, begin and tell me next slide each time you want to share slides. Uh, thank you, Sanslav. <laughs> so today, Uh, today I'll be discussing Spake 2. Um, so next slide, please. This is uh, be a bunch of next slides. So this is the draft and it defines a PAKE with no hash to curve requirements. You can use hash to curve if you want, but it's a pre-existing work item from before the PAKE bake off. Uh, if you look on the data tracker, you'll see a long history and it's supporting work in the Kitten working group. And there's also deployments, um, Magic Wormhole, other ones I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, so there's a recent revision. And the only thing that changed in that revision was since we have the page selection process concluded, was to clarify that this was not selected. Um, so way forward, so we've recently regained a shepherd. Uh, I know I misspelled that. I think it's time for a working group last call. Um, there were some, so there was significant review as part of the PAKE competition, but these were mostly high level issues about the protocol and what it does. There weren't any, to the best of my recollection, little nits like there's a typo here, typo there. If you sent one of those emails, then it's entirely possible that it's not reflected in the revision just because of the you know, got lost in the shuffle. So next, please. Uh, so I can't clean, you know, if you sent me an email about a typo, it's entirely possible it's not there. Um, 
So that concludes my, what I have to say, unless there's any questions from the audience. So, Watson, uh, if you don't mind, uh, one question uh, from myself. Uh, so, as we discussed before the start of the meeting, as far as I, uh, as I understand, you will double check that all the concerns that you are expressed to you during the uh, selection process and that are reflected in the web page on the GitHub uh, of selection process, that uh, you will double check that it's addressed. And after that, you will uh, send us a note that uh, the research group can uh, read the draft knowing that uh, all previous comments have been addressed or at least answered. Yeah, I mean, so my recollection, which I've refreshed, is that the the review process in the Pake Bake Off really, you know, just sort of just said, okay, the protocol has the properties it has. I, I don't think there were specific concerns with the document, but I will double check those reviews carefully. Um, and that's part of the artifact of the process where it was very much a big up and it wasn't a document review aimed at finding pro issues with the documents per se. Yes, you're right. Thank you. I believe that uh, most of the concerns were about the protocol itself. You're right. But I think that some of them can be related to the document. So please check. Why not? Yeah, I, I will. And it would be helpful if people had concerns that might not have been phrased that way to resend them to a list. Um, of course. Any other questions, concerns, comments? Um, this okay. is me. Um, I have a quick question, and that is, uh, um, why did you put, like? Uh, there's different types of curves involved in the the suites that you picked, right? Uh, so uh, the NIST curves. Uh, I think it was. Uh, at 25519, um, they all have different representations. Why wouldn't we just pick uh, one single curve type? As in your, so if I understand your question correctly, it's why don't you limit the draft to say only use curves in short fire stress form or only use curves in um, Edwards form? And the answer is that this is based on application demand, where you have users that would like to that only use the NIST curves that have libraries that handle the NIST curves in the usual format, and they would like to expose on the wire, or they'll like to expose Edwards points on the wire, and the so that that's why we did that. Yeah, but you you mentioned as an application, you mentioned uh, what was called wormhole which I know has been a project uh, in the EU for about three years. Uh, you, didn't, you didn't mention any other applications, right? So uh, it seems that this is a C of a G document. Maybe you can just uh, do a, only a systematic representation and then under the hood, people can always do the calculations on the corresponding address curve, right? So Sorry, you're saying we should remove the, so the document is, there, there's nothing specific about the protocol to the encoding of curve. And if the issue is the test vectors, well, they're test vectors. They're, they're sitting in the draft. They're not, um, but there are applications. I mentioned the Kitten working group. So there, there's Kerberos applications. And that is where those vectors came from. The magic wormhole was not the only application. Mm. Okay, I mean, I'm just a little bit confused uh, because now we get uh, lots more representation types than we ideally would need. We would now have to maintain uh, also the efforts uh, stuff. And that it, basically the, the problem I see long term is that we, IETF, we get uh, basically a bunch of islands with different representations all propagated into different areas. Um, why not just use one systematic way of doing things? It seems to be far easier to maintain, right? Well, what we've what we've learned from experience is that, and this this is not a new issue. This came up in the discussions of Ed two fifty five nineteen adoption. This came up in discussions of Curve two fifty five nineteen discussion, 
what came up is that really the burden to use a different representation is not very much. And the and your your core arithmetic is not affected by this. You can take any elliptic curve and put it in fire stress form through a very simple transformation, no matter what representation it is. And so it's much less of a burden in practice. Yeah, so the, I, I do appreciate that uh, if, if basically the core functionality is not impacted because you have an uh, easy mapping, why not then do the the, the easy mapping on the you know, like uh, it's, 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 it seems to be more or less uh, marketing whitewashing to call everything uh, to consider Edwards curves to be completely different than uh, than any other virus curve, right? Yeah, I Okay, so also we have a comment from Jörn Hasse that it might be worth adding the pointer to the recent paper is uh, uh, you see analysis for SPAKE2. Uh, so the uniform, uniform compatibility models analysis uh, to be presented uh, as Bjorn says. Maybe Bjorn will comment it himself. So um, why don't we want, uh, do you hear me? Yes, yes. Um, okay, I've, um, there's a recent paper um, by, uh, I don't know all the authors, I think it's also by uh, Michel Abdallah and uh, Manuel, who have um, added a very long paper on the security analysis of SPAKE2, and it might, might be worth to add the link in the, in the reference list. And regarding the, the question on how to handle different curves, I do see um, uh, uh, advantages for um, uh, using different representations or uh, specific optimizations for, uh, for some applications. So uh, I think uh, it's worth considering um, to have wire stress curves in addition to other um, point representation. And that might strongly depend on the application type that you're having. And depending on how you implement it, if you enforce some in, some uh, uh, some representation, you might have as a result uh, an increased risk of implementation pitfalls on the other side. Uh, so I think uh, to, to fix one representation in the draft it might be not serving all of the applications perfectly. This is a question I'm all just have asked also to Stanislav, which we will have to discuss also for Cipatra and maybe opaque. Um, for instance, for the question whether we want to add test vectors for Ristretto um, uh, for uh, into drafts such as Spake 2 or Cipatra uh, uh, and or, or, or opaque uh, at some point. Uh, or whether we don't want to, or uh, whether we want to stick uh, simply to to short wire stress representations, and I'd be in the opinion to uh, better add uh, these options uh, because this might these might uh, prevent other pitfalls, implementation pitfalls in some applications. So, um, but there's no right or wrong on uh, on this topic, I think. So that's what I'd uh, uh, have to add. Okay, thanks, Bjorn. Uh, any comments from Watson? I don't have anything to add. Okay, thanks. Any more questions to Watson? Uh, just uh, one more comment. This is Ben Kadok, who I guess on paper is a editor for the draft, but I haven't really been doing much, so maybe you should take me off. Uh, but I can speak a little bit to the Kerberos use case, and I think I see Greg Hudson is on the call as well. Um, but for, for Kerberos, we actually have the implementation of the Edwards 25519 curve that we can, you know, it's license compatible with our code, and we can just include it into our project. Uh, and so that's sort of the built-in functionality. We also have people who want to use the NIST curves for whatever compliance or other reasons but uh, we end up needing to use OpenSSL to implement those. And that has to be like a separate module that you can disable. Um, and so there's sort of different reasons for wanting to have the, the different curves that happen to have the different representations. So from a, a practical point of view, um, I think we might be stuck at least in our implementation to have to support the different curves with the different representations.
Thanks for the comment. Uh, if we don't have any more comments, then many thanks to Watson. And before we go to the presentation from Chris Wood, uh, we have a minor agenda bash. Uh, Jonathan Holland uh, said in the chat that Chris Wierluska wants five minutes and then to ask for reviews from the CFRG for his NPRF design. So uh, after uh, all talks, we'll have, I think, enough time to hear Chris. And now we have Chris Wood and his presentation about uh, AD, AD limits. So this is a new work item. So it's not a work item from CFRG. Uh, we added this as a related item. And so please, Chris, start. Uh, thanks. So, so can everyone hear me OK? Yes, yes. Great, OK. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so this is a document that was born out of work with uh, Felix Gunther, Martin Thompson, and Kenny Patterson, and many others uh, in the Quick Working Group and the TLS Working Groups, uh, as we were trying to figure out how um, limits on AAD algorithms apply to Quick, uh, drawing on experiences that we got from TLS and from recent research that came out um, uh, in the past year. So, next slide, please. Um, so, so I guess some brief background, um, as you all probably know, um, the cryptographic algorithms and the primitives that we use all have limits to them. You can't, for example, take an AED algorithm, a single key, and just encrypt data indefinitely. Um, you know, doing so up, like effectively, or may allow, you know, an adversary to uh, learn information about uh, the. the particular algorithm in use, um, or let me take a step back and say, um, the algorithms basically have limits. Um, and uh, two of the limits that are, I guess, immediately or critically important for these are those that pertain to confidentiality, the secrecy of the data that you're trying to encrypt um, and protect, and the authenticity of the data or the integrity of the data that you're trying to authenticate. Um, the confidentiality limit of a particular AED algorithm effectively uh, corresponds to how much data you can encrypt uh, before you give an adversary some non-negligible advantage in distinguishing um, the AED from a random permutation. So in the normal, uh, you know, in the normal CPA game uh, where an adversary is interacting with either a random permutation or a particular instance of an AED, AED algorithm key uh, with a randomly generated key, given enough queries uh, to this particular encryption oracle, effectively um, the adversary could determine whether or not it's interacting with one of these primitives or the other. Uh, and the goal is to make it so that the adversary can't do that by limiting how much data uh, can actually be encrypted. Uh, on the integrity side, uh, we're more or less concerned with trying to limit how many decryption attempts can be made before an adversary can successfully forge an AED ciphertext. Um, and similar game, AED algorithm, or an adversary is given access to a decryption oracle. Um, you can query, query, query. Uh, and eventually, if given enough attempts, it can uh, produce a valid AED ciphertext that decrypts uh, successfully. And then as such forges the, the packet, or forges um, uh, a ciphertext. So one of the, uh, I guess, important things to know is that these limits uh, influence the protocols which make use of these AED algorithms. So for example, TLS 1.3 has limits uh, on how much data can be encrypted uh, for a given connection. Uh, and the limits pertain to, or are specific to each of these cipher suites that are supported um, by, the, by the protocol. Uh, so you can check out RC 446, section 5.5 for more details there. Um, importantly, TLS only focuses on the confidentiality limit, and that's because uh, because TLS typically runs traditionally over TCP, which ensures in-order arrival. An adversary can only, really only try to forge a single packet before effectively tearing down or causing a connection failure. Um, so in practice, they're, 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 the integrity limit is not really important for TLS, but uh, uh, for quick, if you could advance to the next slide, 
please. Um, oh, shoot. Um, uh, but I'll get to that in a minute. But uh, for quick, it is a problem. Um, another th quick thing to note, uh, the limits that are exist in TLS are uh, they pertain to what we call uh, single user security, which is effectively, uh, if you look at a single instance of an AAD keyed with a, a single key, the adversary's goal is to you know break either the confidentiality or the integrity guarantees of that AAD of that specific instance. Um, there has this, there's this other related notion called multi-user security, which considers um, all uses or all instances of an AED algorithm sort of executing in parallel um, with different independent keys uh, and the adversary, of course, being able to see all of these ciphertexts that are encrypted in transit and in use. Um, but instead, or unlike in the single user security case where the adversary's goal is to sort of break either confidentiality or integrity of a single specific AED instance. Here, the goal is uh, to break confidentiality security of any one of the instances effectively chosen at random. Um, so depending on you know, the application and threat model you're concerned about, um, single user or multi-user security bounds uh, may be important for you. Um, and we try to cover them both uh, in the draft. Next slide, please. Um, going back to why this uh, draft even exists in the first place, as I was saying at the beginning, um, uh, there's some recent uh, research that was done uh, specifically for Quick, which looked at the effect of, uh, you know, Quick's transport mechanisms and how it uh, impacts um, the uh, effectively the usage of AED algorithms inside of Quick. Um, so as I was saying earlier, TLS uh, doesn't really consider the integrity limit to be part of a, a, a problem in practice because, again, any single uh, forgery attempt or you know adversary injecting a packet into a connection that doesn't decrypt successfully will result in connection failure and the keys are thrown away and everything's done. Um, Quick, in contrast, allows uh, multiple forgery attempts because the protocol is specifically designed to allow out-of-order delivery of packets so endpoints need to be able to process or handle, you know, effectively what are either out of order packets or potentially forgery attempts from from an adversary. Um, so in, you know, as a result of this this work that came out, um, we had to go back and look at all of the different cipher suites that were in use in the protocol uh, and see whether or not they needed to be whether the limits needed to be adjusted and several things sort of came out of that um, that reanalysis. The first of which was that ASCCM uh, didn't really have any uh, analysis that could be readily or easily used. Um, so at first we were considering just abandoning ASCCM altogether inside of Quick, which would leave just GCM and Chaja Poly uh, as the only AADs that were left. Um, but there, you know, with uh, working with uh, Martin and Felix and some others, uh, we sort of I think we got that squared away and we you know we we went and looked at the relevant uh results and we extracted uh the confidentiality and integrity limits from that um or a simplified version of the confidentiality and integrity limits of that and <clears throat> baked it into the latest uh quick specification another thing we started to reconsider was whether or not the single user threat model was actually relevant uh for quick um, so there's a change, uh, proposed change to the quick specification up right now, which effectively transitions from what was limits previously considered in a single user security model over to a multi-user security model. Uh, and the reason we did this is because um, it, it seems, if you think about a single connection that's potentially performing multiple key updates, um, each key update, which is a, a process by which endpoints hash forward you know, their traffic keys and, you know, derive new encryption keys and new nonces and whatnot, effectively introduces a new independent key into uh, sort of the, the scope of that connection. Um, and that very nicely aligns with the, you know, the notion of uh, multi-user security where you have these multiple independent AED instances and an adversary's goal then is to, you know, break any single one of them, not necessarily a specific one. So um, basically, uh, we started to question whether or not 
um, we had the right limits in place for all of the cipher suites that we needed to consider and whether or not those limits were um, taking into account the right adversarial threat model. Um, to sort of make matters, I guess, harder uh, for that particular work, all of the, uh, the limits that were uh, known or published for these cipher suites uh, were scattered across different papers um, using different notation, um, which was sometimes, it was more often than not inconsistent. Uh, some of the results were incomplete. So for example, we don't really have any uh, separate confidentiality or integrity limits for Cha Cha Poly. Um, the only known analysis on the limits of that particular AAD combine the two together. So instead of having a confidentiality integrity limit, you have a single um, AAD limit. So how many packets can you encrypt and how many packets can you decrypt, for example, or really it's blocks, how many like plain text blocks can you process before the adversary gains a non-negligible advantage in the in a mutual AAD style game. Um, and then some of them are incomplete. So we don't have multi-user security balance for Chacha Poly either. So um, uh, given this, we thought, if you can advance to the next slide, please. Um, it would be very useful if we could sort of extract all this information that's scattered around these different papers and documents into a single place um, that covers all of the known AAD algorithms that we are using for quick and TLS um, and, you know, presents the formulations for the limits in a very simple uh, EC2 digest manner, uh, specifically targeted towards protocol designers who need to bake these limits into like protocol mechanisms, like Quick, for example. Um, and we tried to present the limits in such a way that are um, easily sort of enforceable in practice. So for example, that means basing the limits on the number of uh, message blocks that are processed uh, in the context of a given key. And for example, what sort of success probability is reasonable for a given adversary um, in a given use case. Um, we, for Quick specifically, um, we just borrowed the same success probability that we used in TLS. Um, but in the drafts, we keep it as a variable in case people want to potentially raise it or lower it, depending on how paranoid they are. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so the, the scope of the document currently includes um, all AADs that are used for Quick and TLS. Um, so it doesn't have any of the, uh, for example, CIV, uh, AAD algorithms like ASGCM CIV, but potentially could include that in the future. Does not include any unauthenticated blocks and remotes, like counter mode or CBC mode or anything. Um, and the editor copy includes uh, both single multi user security uh, limits. It does not, the draft that's published in the data tracker uh, currently does not have multi user security. Um, and we included both specifically because we wanted um, uh, to, you know, not to encourage or recommend any particular threat model for a given application, but to make it so that uh, application and protocol designers could choose, you know, whichever limit most more readily applied to their, their given circumstance. Uh, next slide, please. Um, right, so, uh, so from future work, um, we uh, would like to sort of expand the, the guidance that we have in there for protocol design developers. Um, we have some text which basically describes like how to take these limits and how to sort of imply or uh, uh, apply and enforce them in the context of the protocol, but uh, surely there could be more words there to make it a bit easier for people coming at this from more of a transport perspective. Um, uh, it would be great if at the end we could actually compute some of these uh, limits and bounds uh, for common parameters. Um, uh, I think the ASGCM CIV RFC has such bounds pre-computed already uh, in, a, in an appendix, and the idea would be to do something similar to that. There is um, the, the link here if you go to the slides and you download them. Um, there is a, a page in which we sort of allow people to play with certain parameters uh, to compute these bounds sort of dynamically or interactively. Um, and the idea would just be to uh, uh, sort of include that information in an appendix um, so that people don't have to do it themselves. Uh, and that's the, the changes that we made to the quick document were very much 
uh, doing exactly that. We didn't, we didn't, I mean, while we did some of the derivation work in the document, just to show that our work was uh, correct or to uh, encourage people that are, uh, that our work was correct. Um, uh, at the end, we just derive the limits directly and don't leave it as an exercise to the reader. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so some questions for the group. Um, we, uh, Felix, Martin, and I uh, felt this was, um, at least we wanted to codify, you know, the, the knowledge that we gained in doing this analysis for Quick and TLS. So at the very least, it was useful to us. Um, and we're wondering whether or not this is useful uh, to the CFRG and potentially to uh, other IETF protocols. So uh, it'd be helpful to know whether or not people think this is something we should uh, keep doing and pursuing. Um, if so, it'd be great to know if there are people who are willing to review and provide feedback. I will say, obviously, um, uh, we are not perfect and we have made arithmetic mistakes along the way. Um, and we may have made mistakes in translating results from papers. Um, entirely possible. So the more eyes we have on this, the better. Um, and assuming all those are good, uh, I'm curious to know whether or not the RG is interested in adopting and moving this forward. Uh, and that is it. I see there are some questions. Many thanks, Chris. So I believe that the first question was from Yuri Blumenthal. Uh, why are you excluding SAV? Uh, safe? Uh, Yuri, would you like um, to comment this? Uh, yes, I wonder why uh, SIV modes are excluded, especially since at least uh, GCM SIV already comes with uh, pre-computed bounds. So your work would said, be even easier. Yeah, as I said, like that's why there's an S uh, on the slide. They're only excluded because we didn't type the words into the keyboard yet. Um, there's no reason they should be excluded uh, going forward. Like, I, we don't have a very compelling reason to exclude them. Obviously, if this is a, a particular AED that people are using in practice, we would like to cover it here um, because we don't want to end up in a situation where, yet again, there are, you know, more bounds um, or more of these. Uh, there are multiple documents you have to consult in order to, to identify what the bounds are. So that's the reason. Uh, we just haven't gotten to it yet. Many thanks. I'd like to uh, suggest, request, uh, prioritizing it. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Yuri. Uh, then, if you, if it's possible, a comment from me with my chair's hat off. I really support uh, this document. Uh, I believe this is really important, and uh, I am. Really happy that uh, this is the uh, uh, second document on the topic of the limits of usage of um, of the block ciphers in various modes. We have recently had uh, RFC 8645 uh, on Rekeying, and now this is uh, a draft on usage limits on AD algorithms. I believe that is really an important work, important for all IETF. And uh, I believe that uh, this is one of the things that CFRG must be working on, providing the guidance to the ITF uh, how to use crypto. So in my personal opinion, it's really a very important work. So I would be happy to support it and uh, to review it if, if needed. Uh, so I think it's really great work. Thank you. And then we have comments in the chat. Uh, from Scott Fluter. Scott, would you like to announce your question? Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and specifically with the G, uh, uh, the GCM cipher suite and TLS, I don't know about Quick. Uh, they deliberately include 32 bits from uh, KDF data in, inside the NOS actually used. Uh, this was designed specifically to increase the security against multi-user attacks. Does your doc, uh, I'm just looking at your document now, I haven't seen it before. Does, do you address that sort of thing? Yeah, the, you, so uh, the limit, other... sorry, go ahead. Uh, or, do, uh, or do, and do you try to cover other uh, uses specific uh, uh, protections which are not actually part of the underlying crypto as well? No, yeah, so that's a good question. Um, 
the usage or the AEDs that we cover are those that are specifically used inside of TLO. So yes, the, the it does the limits are derived based on that particular usage of ASGCM. The limits, as you suggest, are worse for multi-user security if you just apply sort of ASGCM out of the box, which TLS 1.3 and Quick do not do. Thank you. Uh, then there is a question from Dmitry Belovsky. Dmitry? Uh -huh. Hello. Uh, I'm uh, very fond of uh, this uh, document. I strongly support its adoption, uh, but uh, I also am interested in uh, adding uh, the multilinear Gallus mod MGM to the comparison. Uh, uh, just uh, to understand uh, its place in the AID world. Thank you. Uh, so we limited it to AID algorithms that have uh, wide adoption. Um, and specifically, we started with those that were included in TLS and QUIC. Um, so uh, I'm not personally opposed to it, but I would like to hear from other people as to whether or not it's, it makes sense to include it. Um, I'm not aware of any uh, like large you know, scale uses of that particular AAD. Uh, okay, go, go strong ahead. Feelings. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. If you'd like to file, there's a GitHub repository for the draft. Um, I'll try to include a link uh, when I'm done. Uh, if you'd like to file an issue suggesting to include it, that would be very useful. Got it. Thanks. There's a question from Watson. Watson, please. So, looking at the draft, it seems that there's these are sort of formulas copied out of papers, which is great. But then when you check them and you check that it came out of the paper, you aren't actually checking the formula. I'm wondering if there's because these two theorems for for cha cha and and AESGCM are virtually identical. Is there some way we could more you know more formally get the right result and just plug in the block size and that one's a PRF and the other is a PRP? and get out the right result, or is that just not going to work? Uh, I'm not sure. Um, so uh, maybe, but uh, I, Felix, I think, is a bit more adept at you know figuring out the actual bounce. So um, he's here. I don't know, Felix, if you want to sort of tune in or chime in and answer that. Yeah, hi. Um, I'm, I'm not sure I entirely understood your question, Watson. Um, in, in in which way you suggest to to make better use of the paper balance, or is that? My, my suggestion is that if you write down, so, so you want to check that this formula is correct. And right now, when we when the when the correct when they would just look at this paper. You know, there's some huge detailed proof for ASGCM. There's a different, there's a very similar, very detailed proof for Cha Cha, whatever. And but both of these th proofs are essentially the same. And so I'm wondering if there's some some way to combine the you have a single combined formula, check that very carefully, and then you're just plugging in some values. So I I wouldn't know whether. There's the chance to give like a combined formula for the different AAD modes. I think um, Chris, correct me, but I our perspective would be to give um, some background information on how to translate kind of from the paper results from the paper bounds to the bounds we would give in the document, so that. Um, if you're just interested in like how to apply the bounds, you wouldn't like kind of need that reference, but kind of as like a, a way to track down where the different numbers come from. Along that way, as Chris already mentioned, we will need to um, explain in quite some, well, we'll have to take care and, and, and need to explain in some detail um, that the different um, published papers um, do make quite varied assumptions. So we're trying to unify them, but this process of unifying introduces kind of assumptions in the translation. And I guess we'll hope to um, uh, spell those out um, as explicitly as possible. But I guess that's still like um, further work on the document. Yeah, I think that's right. 
Thanks. There's also a comment from Philip Hallenbaker. Philip, would you like to uh, say it? So there is a message from Philip in the chat that Philip supports this work and uh, some concerns about uh, encryption of large files. Philip, would you like to say it yourself? Philip, you, you are muted. We don't hear you. Okay, Philip, I'm sorry, but we can't hear you. And Stanislav, you skipped my comment. Uh, sorry, please. Wait. Yeah, he was just voting SIV and then asking about post quantum threat model. Do you want to ask a question here? Yeah, so. Um, I obviously support the document and uh, uh, plus one to Yuri on uh, SIV. And then I'm not even sure if it's a good question, but uh, I'm very interested in, uh, in analysis of these modes uh, as they apply to a post-quantum uh, threat model, obviously confidentiality and not integrity. Um, so if that is, should be applicable, I would very much support it in the document. Uh, we haven't at all uh, used the word post-quantum in discussing this document yet. Uh, so I, 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 we haven't really thought very much about it. Um, yeah. Okay. Okay, then we have a question from Dan Hawkins. Dan? Yeah, thanks. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, I, I haven't read your draft yet. I, I just pulled it up and I'm scanning through it. it look, uh, do you talk to uh, any of the situations where, let's say, the AAD was significantly greater than the amount of plain text? And what are there any limits that of on AAD that can affect the confidentiality and integrity bounds? Uh, yeah. So. Um... We assume, and this is probably something we need to make very clear in the document, that the AAD is much less uh, than the, the any of the plain text that's being encrypted. Um, so, and if you think of Quick and TLS, for example, it's just like the record headers or the the packet headers. Um, uh, that said, there are certain cipher suites, particularly like ASCCM, to which if there were um, a large amount of AAD that would affect the limits um, and the simplifications that we've made would be n not accurate in those cases. So um, I don't know how we could, uh, we, or, we have not discussed how to potentially deal with um, that assumption that we've made, that the AAD is much, much smaller than the plain text and typically a fixed size. Um, but it's a very good point to raise. and. Um, I will, I'll file an issue to track it so we can have that discussion. Um, you. But Thank for right now, much. I don't really know of a good way to present it, yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Thanks. We've got one more comment from Yuri. Uh, Yuri, would you like to tell it? Yuri? That seems obvious enough. Yes, I also support this work. And uh, I would like to upload the suggestion uh, to bring post-quantum in. Okay. Thanks for the comment. Um, so if we don't have any more comments, uh, my proposal as a chair uh, will be to uh, announce a call for adoption in the mailing list. I believe that a lot of people will support this. But maybe some new comments will occur. So if no one objects, we'll have an adoption call in the CFRG mailing list. Okay. It seems that we don't have a new comment. Uh, so uh, the last presentation is about VOPRF. Alex, please. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes. Hi. Uh, so, yeah, I'm uh, Alex. I'm just going to be talking about uh, one of the CFRGs um, 
drafts that are currently that's currently uh, moving forward and that's uh, on oblivious pseudo random functions and so this talk is going to be focusing on the latest updates that we've had in the uh, in the 04 edition um, and and then uh, we're going to uh, hopefully canvas opinion on whether on the state of the draft and what the next steps will be uh, so next slide please uh, next slide please <laughs> so uh, just as a, a recap, in case um, you're not familiar with the functionality, so an oblivious seed random function um, has a client in a server, uh, and the client's trying to learn the evaluation of a pseudo random uh, function on the server's key on some on one of on their chosen input X. And the the security behind an oblivious pseudo random function is that uh, this input X is blinded and is not revealed to the server during the protocol. So. Generally, what happens is this, the client sends a blinded form of the input X um, in such a way that the server can still evaluate the pseudo random function, in, even with the input blinded, and then sends this blinded evaluation back. And then the client can uh, eva uh, well, output the PRF evaluation um, by unblinding uh, its input. And and the sec and obviously, there's another um, a security assumption which we're making here, which is that the server uh, that the client does not learn anything about the service key. Um, so next slide, please. And then there's a second, a second mode of the oblivious pseudo random function, uh, whereby uh, everything's the same except the server sends back uh, a zero knowledge proof that it used the key k in evaluating a pseudo random function. So here the client uh, has an extra step where they verify the proof and then blind. And this just proves to the client that the uh, server has actually evaluated the pseudo random function. Um, this is typically useful because pseudo random function evaluations are by their very nature uh, look, uh, look random. So typically the client wouldn't be able to tell if the server just sent back some uh, garbled like bytes. So this proof attests to the fact that the server has actually evaluated the function. Um, so next slide, please. So in this draft, um, we specifically talk about constructing oblivious pseudo random functions in prime order groups. And this, uh, this slide provides like a little bit of an um, overview of how this works. So again, the, the client server have, uh, have, have their inputs. So the client's input X and the server's K. Uh, in, this, in this setting, X is like some string of bytes and the server's key K is a scalar in the Galois field associated with some prime order group. And there's also this public key, which is KG. So G is the generator of the group. And this is an optional extra if you want verifiability, which I'll talk about um, in a moment. So the first step is the, uh, the client computes um, this hash to group, which is this H2G function of X. So this converts X, which is a string of bytes, into a group element, and then multiplies it by some random scalar R, which is uh, known as the blind. So it can, it, and this uh, computes a group element P, which it sends to the server. And for the server to evaluate the blinded C random function, it, it multiplies this uh, group element P by the key K. And this gives us Q, which it sends back to the client. And in the, in the verifiable mode, so in this VOPRF mode, uh, the server will also provide a proof that the discrete log of the public key, which is K, is equivalent to the discrete log of Q, which is also K. Um, and the client on uh, receiving Q in this optional proof P, it can, um, it's, not, it's not too important here how this uh, POF evaluation is computed, but it's based on uh, a paper of Yaraki, Kravchik, and Kiyosh uh, from 2014. And essentially, this uh, H is computes like a, a random oracle evaluation over um, X. And then this unblinding of Q, which is like you take the inverse of R and you multiply it by Q. And this unblinds it because you remove the R. Uh, and the verifying the proof is a, is a simple, like non interactive zero knowledge verification um, of a proof. Um, so this is how uh, the VOPRF works in the primary group setting. So next slide, please. So the reason, the reason uh, these things are important is that there's a number of applications which have come out quite recently. So um, uh, firstly, there's this privacy pass protocol, which has recently been made uh, into a working group with the IETF, which uses uh, VOPRFs extensively in constructing uh, anonymity preserving uh, authorization protocols on the internet. Uh, there's 
the opaque draft, um, which uh, constructs a password authenticated key exchange based on oblivious pseudorandom functions. And there's also um, a practical instantiation of um, privacy pass related um, uh, a privacy pass related API in the Chrome browser known as the Trust Token API. And this uses um, functionality related to these uh, BBC random functions as well. So next slide, please. And next slide. So uh, in uh, this version four of the draft, uh, there's some major API changes which were made. So um, firstly, the client and server uh, now control these global contexts, which um, which essentially dictate whether they are operating in the oblivious user random function mode or in the verifiable oblivious user random function mode. And this just makes the function instantiations easier to write. So we can now um, coalesce around these six functions and two of these are new. So the server now has a key gen uh, function which was required for the opaque application. And there's also a verify finalize operation. Um, so the verify, so essentially um, these functions correspond to what uh, the client and server does in the protocol. So firstly, the client runs blind, uh, sends the output to the server, and the server returns the output of evaluate to the client who unblinds and then finalizes to return the PRF value. And this verify finalize is an optional function that's not used by the protocol, but is used by some applications for verifying that the client has performed the finalized step uh, appropriately. Um, there was a previous efficiency improvement uh, known as batching, whereby the client could evaluate, could um, supply multiple inputs to the server and receive multiple evaluations with a single proof object, which attested to the um, to the fact that the server evaluated all these tokens correctly. Um, and we've essentially removed this as as like as default functionality because it was it was uh, complicating matters. And so we now present uh, this batching optimization as an efficiency improvement, which you can make optionally. Uh, so next slide, please. Um, in terms of Cypher Suites, we previously didn't use Cypher Suites associated with 128-bit security groups. And this was because um, essentially there's this um, a way of converting an oblivious pseudorandom function into an oracle uh, for, uh, for creating static um, Q-strong Diffie-Hellman uh, samples, which can lower the security of the group. Um, but we've re we've reinstated these uh, we've reinstated cipher suites associated with these groups because there are settings such as an opaque where um, this Q, uh, this oracle can't be constructed and so you don't lower the security of those groups. So uh, we've presented these cipher suites back into the document with the caveat that um, we've still got the security analysis associated with the key strong Diffie-Hellman attacks and if um, and you should bear this in mind when you're implementing these cipher suites. And we used to have a, a host of site hash functions, which did uh, various different things, but now we can, uh, we've removed all of these and they also used to be HMAP and HKDF and now we've turned this all into a single um, SHA-512 uh, hash function. Uh, next slide, please. So in terms of what Cypher Suites we now actually support, so we have Cypher Suites based around um, all, uh, so Curve 25519 and Curve 448, and then we have all the missed curves. Um, and we provide advice based on each different curve on how to instantiate a prime order group from any of these curves. Um, and that's also a new feature of this draft. And essentially, yeah, the only other thing is this uh, hash function. So currently, as I said, we, we use um, we use curve 25519 and curve 448 um, directly, but in a few in well, hopefully in a future version of the draft, we're looking to replace these with either a stretch or a decaf. Uh, decaf because they give them a much better interface for implementing a prime order group. Um, so I think I'll speak about this later, but I think um, hopefully that's going to be something that we do in the future. So next slide, please. And so yeah, um, in terms of the prime order group API, uh, we've we've added now like a concrete API for what we expect from a prime order group. We used to expose group elements in the inputs and outputs of the function, and we've uh, removed that. And we've group elements are now only referred to internally in each of the API functions. So now they just take bytes as inputs and return bytes as outputs. And as I said, we've, in, we've included instructions for implementing prime order groups for all the ECC site suites. I think in the NIST case, it's not, there's not too many considerations, but given the cofactor 
um, cofactors that you have with curve 25519 and 448, um, there's specific things that you have to watch out for. So next slide, please. So there's some other small updates. So there's now a Sage implementation, which is uh, uh, for as a proof of concept of the entire functionality. Um, there was a lot of like DST usage, which wasn't uh, so domain separation tag usage, which wasn't uh, consistent. So we've uh, improved that based on um, what was uh, based on the standard set in the hash to curve draft. And this also allows us to remove like more complicated uh, random oracle functionality, and we can replace it with just SHA 512 with like a prefix in a prefix free setting. And we've also like pulled in the latest updates from hash to curve. Uh, for instantiating the prime order group. So next slide, please. And yeah. Uh, so in terms of to-dos, uh, there are some proof of concept implementa implementations which are separate and they're written in Go, Rust, and Boring SSL. So we want to update them to be compliant with the new draft. Um, it'd be good to get some more opinions on implementing Restretto and Decaf sites. So I think Restretto, obviously, there's, a, there's an existing draft, but with Decaf, I think uh, Mike Hamburg posted uh, sort of a candidate document to the mailing list, and it'd be good to hear uh, whether uh, that may be turned into either a future document or incorporated with Restretto in the future, uh, because that's something we'd be interested in implementing. And also, we need to put in some like stable test vectors into the draft as well. And next slide, please. And so, yeah, finally, um, so I think some core questions that uh, would be helpful for us to answer is um, we think the API should be stable now. And, and if anyone here has any thoughts on the state of the document on, on where it could be improved on anything that we might have missed, and that'd be useful. And also, if there's any sort of what, what uh, people would like to see in terms of uh, getting this document to like a uh, uh, research group lab call in the, in the near future. So thank you. Uh, many thanks, Alex. Uh, so we have two questions in the chat. Uh, first of all, the question from Yuri. Yuri, would you like to say it? It would appear that uh, SHA-3 would serve you better in both a KDF role and a MAC role. So would you consider using that instead of, say, uh, SHA-512? Um, so I think we'd be happy to consider it. I think um, what so we don't explicitly do any key derivation with SHA five twelve. Uh, it's mainly to we use it um, to generate random field elements. Um, and so I mean, if you have any, if you have any opinion, if you think that uh, SHA three might be might serve us better in that case, and that's something we're willing to consider. Um, do, do, uh, what what sort of characteristics? Uh, SHA-2, uh, where uh, PRFs uh, sort uh, by happening, because you cannot really have a a good cryptographic hash unless it does some decent thing. SHA-3 uh, has uh, being a PRF as a design requirement, explicit. And it was included in its analysis, unlike uh, SHA-1 and SHA-2. Mm -hmm. In my opinion, that would be a good uh, a reason uh, to consider uh, rolling it in now, especially at the uh, state where uh, your draft seems to seems to be able to uh, accommodate it, that there is no background uh, uh, backwards compatibility yet that uh, would slow you down and prevent from changing. Okay, thank you. We will consider it. Many thanks. Uh, then there's a question from Bjorn Hasse. Bjorn? Bjorn, would you like to say it or just leave it in the chat? 
so I need to switch on the microphone. So in your draft, you mandatorily require the random oracle version of the map uh, for generating the, the point. And this implies that you force the implementer to use the AdWords form because you need to add two uh, arbitrary points. Is this actually mandatory or would not a, uh, be a simple mapping be sufficient? Uh, because in this phase, case, you would be free to use, use for instance, the X25519 ladder implementation. Um, so I th we, we need a uniform group element for, as the output of the function. So I believe the random oracle version of that function gives us, gives us that. I'm not sure whether a simpler functionality would give us the, the assurances of that. Uh, uniformity of the output group element. Uh, Bjorn, uh, other comments? Mm -hmm. uh, okay, thanks. And there is a question from Rene Strick. Rene, would you like to say it? Okay, um, just a quick question. I, I put it in the chat. I, I don't really understand what the benefit is of using Ristretto or some of those other functionalities in this uh, particular application. So, so I would like to understand it better. Right? So um, uh, uh, for me, at least, uh, the benefit of using Ristretto or DCAP is that they provide a unified um, encoding for essentially mapping these curves to prime order groups, which is what uh, which is the situation we need to use for the protocol. So um, given that Ristretto is like a current CFRG um, research group item, I, uh, I think it, we would benefit from using that unified encoding rather than uh, going, is it going down a potentially like divergent route um, for instantiating the prime order group. I can add a quick comment here too. Um, in supporting curve 25519 and curve 448 in the current draft for VOPRF, there is an expensive check that involves making sure that uh, a potentially maliciously controlled point is not on the prime order subgroup. Um, using Ristretto or decaf uh, eliminates the cost of that check. Uh, the, the the problem is that we then introduce essentially yet more other varieties of the two five five one uh, uh, family, right? Uh, Can I really quick? Uh, if I understand, uh, there was. Uh, Comment from Bjorn Haas, uh, uh, another question from Bjorn Haas about uh, Chateau. Uh, Bjorn, would you like to, to clarify something? Or just leave it as it is? Not, not, just, a, not a, just a question, but uh, just an observation that many implementations which use Curve 25519 uh, also have a, come with an uh, implementation of SHA 512 because uh, of the use in at 25519 signatures. So um, that's a good reason, in my opinion, to, to pair these two algorithms together. Uh, and this is not so common with, uh, with uh, uh, SHA-3. So um, one would ha might have more difficulty in finding uh, it, the implementations, uh, 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 existing code. Okay, thanks for this comment. Uh, any other comments, questions? I'd just if like to second need... that. Um, this is Chris. Uh, I mean, SHA-3 is great. Uh, it's not really widespread enough uh, that it would make the implementation story for protocols dependent on OPRF uh, more difficult. Like OPAKE, for example, requires the OPRF. And if we were to integrate OPAKE, into TLS, as we were sort of working to do, I would introduce this new SHA-3 dependency on like a TLS stack, which isn't, not all TLS stacks have right now. So um, I, I think it's sticking with SHA-512 makes sense. Okay, any other comments, concerns, questions? Okay, so then thanks, Alex. And so we have the last item. It was from the 
Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, a comment from Yuri. Yuri would like to disagree about SHA-3. Yuri? Just to emphasize the point that it is uh, relatively a new, but unlike a previous uh, uh, SHA versions, th this one is a, a result of an international competition. It comes with uh, formal proofs and much, much better explicit design requirements. And uh, since uh, the uh, uh, protocols and functions we are talking about are also new, I do not see a concern with uh, appearing something that hasn't been uh, used much uh, before with something that hasn't been used much before. The argument that uh, I, I, TLS, for example, does not normally, currently, uses SHA-3. Surprise, it doesn't use opaque. It doesn't use uh, verifiable PRF. It doesn't use a lot of other things. So what? You add code for this, you could add code for that. I think if we need it later on, we can just add a new Cypher Suite to introduce SHA-3. Like, for right now, I think. Sticking with Shadow 512 is fine. I, I definitely agree with the points that you made, but the, the entire reason we have Cypher Suites is to allow this accessibility into the future. So I think we should do that. Okay, many thanks for the comments. So we have the last item Christopher Mruska. Christopher, please. Um, yeah, uh, thank you for uh, including me on uh, short notice. So I'm Chris. And um, so we have um, a cryptographically relevant change suggestion to the um, IETF standard uh, for messaging layer security. And uh, John Turner suggested to me yesterday to present the suggestion here to get your attention for cryptographic validation. So um, let me uh, can you share content. Um, Um, somehow, somehow it looks like it cannot share content. Sorry. So the share content button uh, just on the right from the camera. Right. Um, this is annoying. Right. Um, if you have it downloaded somewhere, you can just uh, send the, the link to the chat and I'll share the content instead of you. Um, okay, um, I, um, um, I will, yeah, let's, let's use this one, so I um, um, wanted to share it a little bit more, but um, maybe you can just open this. Okay. Or you can try to proceed without slides, if it's possible. Um, uh, could you... Could you be so kind and visit the link that I sent um, in an email today? Um, and then, in fact, I can see the link in the chat. Okay. Um, um, so the last question I see is uh, the comment from Alexa Melnikov about trust free debate to the safer doing this. Yes, I see this. Okay. Thank you. So it's not a slide, it's, uh, it's a please, 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 please go to page eight. Sorry? Page eight. Page eight, okay. Page eight. Um, so there are, there are no numbers on the, on the pages. <laughs> Sorry, further, further, one page further. Apologies for this. Okay, one, one page back, and then we're there. Okay, good. So, good. Um, yeah. The, the um the um so the um in the um very good the, the lower diagram is the one that I would like to talk about. Um so um this is um part of the key schedule of 
um, the current draft of the uh, messaging uh, layer security protocol. Um, and at the top, you see there is an init secret um, uh, that goes into the key derivation. And then from the left comes the PSK. And then a little bit later, there comes this commit secret. And what these kind of extract, expand, um, extract calls do is that they um, uh, that they combine these three keys into the epoch secret, which should be pseudorandom if either of the um, three keys is pseudorandom. And then the last expand function derives a bunch of um, several um, several keys from um, from from the epoch secret. So um, let me first say what is the suggestion, how to change this, and then afterwards explain uh, why, um, why it was suggested to change it. So the suggestion to change it is on the next page. The next page is? Yeah, the next page. Yeah, very good. Thanks. Yeah, perfect. So, um, so the um, so the idea is to replace this very sequential construction uh, by a parallel construction, where um, one runs each of the three secrets through an expand function, um, then XORs the result, um, and then feeds the result into um, this expand function to um, to derive the the different secrets. So um, okay, so this is a suggestion for the change. Um, why was this change suggested? So the first observation is that this uh, new function is um, more parallel and maybe also a little bit simpler construction. Um, but the actual issue is that um, the extract function in the uh, current draft needs to be a dual PRF. Um, could you go back to the previous um, page? So, um, so this um, this extract function. Um, uh, the, the top extract function, it needs to behave as a PRF when it's keyed by the PSK. Um, and it needs to be behave, needs to behave as a PRF when it's keyed with the, um, with the, with the init secret. Um, the, um, the issue is if, um, if either of the two inputs is, um, um, is, is, uh, is malleable, um, then, um, um, one might need to be twice and therefore has a, a dual PRF functionality for this extract function. Um, and um, so, um, so the um, original suggestion for this extract function um, had this idea that um, um, for one of the, um, the directions, the key material is only used once. Um, and so, in this case, one relies on other cryptographic means ensuring that key materials only used once. So, um, for the new construction, um, could you go to the um, next page again? Um, uh, what one needs to um, observe is that X or is, of course, like extremely uh, malleable um, operation. It's, it's not a collision resistant operation. Uh, so. Uh, what is used in these three expand calls is this uh, context value, which needs to be a unique value um, and a label to, um, to have domain separation. And because this context value is the same in all the three expand calls, um, the uh, resulting values always change simultaneously. Um, and the, um, so this unique value context is used once for um, domain separation for the pseudorandomness. And then later in the lower expand call, you see it's also used. Um, and here it's, um, uh, it's ensuring that you get, uh, that you get unique outputs. Um, so, so the collision resistance is provided by this um, last expand call and having a different context value um, in, um, yeah, in, uh, uh, in each of these calls to 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 this big effort and um, so um, the uh, IETF working group for MLS um, liked this idea, but not many cryptographers have uh, looked at it. And so we would um, like to get us some feedback. And so um, sorry for um, not having kind of prepared a formal uh, presentation of this proposal, but mainly wanted to raise your attention. There is this um, um, 
paper that you can, uh, if you're interested, or you can also contact me and um, discuss the proof or uh, give me any feedback. You can also give me feedback now, but mainly I wanted to raise your attention that um, there's a cryptographic relevant change in the MLS uh, working group uh, where we would like to have some feedback. That's it. Hi, Christopher. Cool question. Can we include uh, your, uh, your paper as a slide in our slide deck for CFRG? Oh. Yes. Thanks. That, that will be just useful for people going back through this. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Chris. Uh, so there are two questions. The first question is from Chelsea. Chelsea, please. Hi. Um... Yeah, so this is a really interesting idea. Can you talk about your proofs and how maybe uh, your proofs of security operate within the larger MLS sort of context? And if there's any kind of gaps that you see between like where your proofs of security are and like where the um, larger protocol is for MLS. Okay, all right. Um, so um, kind of, um, the so the um um the so well I guess I, I just spent four years working on the TLS key schedule so so the kind of the uh, the MLS proof as a kind of complete proof with all details as a computational proof um at at least is is is, is not uh, is not there but this is kind of modular change. Uh, which um, you could also adapt in the same way for for for, for TLS. So this only changes uh, this only changes the way a local computation is done, whereas the interface with um, with other uh, primitives remains the same. Okay, so you don't see like just at looking at this at a high level, you don't see any gaps or I, kind of assumptions that you're making between. Uh, how it applies in the TLS context in here? Uh, sorry? Yeah. Oh, just like any kind of gaps from when you apply this in a TLS context to applying it in the MLS context. No, I, so, so um, I think the, like from, from my perspective, um, the most important part is uh, getting a hold of this uh, unique context value. Um, and um, from the discussion in the working group, this seemed not to be problem, but yeah, I, I don't see. Um... Thanks. Uh, then there is a question from or comment from Watson. Watson, please. So, uh, so my question is, why not just run everything through SHA-3? I mean, it's supposed to have the, with, with appropriate differentiators on each input, it's supposed to have the right properties to do this sort of randomness extraction. So, uh, so, so you mean, um, you mean to replace the X or with SHA-3? Or do I you mean, mean re to repaint everything with SHA-3? Yeah, what, what you want to do is you want to take in a bunch of inputs and you want to derive mm -hmm. an arbitrary amount of, of output data that's random if the inputs are random. And this is exactly the, the sort of thing the sponge construction gives you. Okay, excellent question. So. Um, so the um, uh, the the issue is that the, the that the thing that I would like to um, would like to to um, to prevent is that key material is used twice when um, some other key material changes. Um, so um, so so say um, so say you have a, you have a you have a you have a big group and and, and something goes wrong and and each party uses like some of these secrets and, and so you have multiple derivations um uh, three people use the same commit secret three people use the same psk three people use the same init secret each time with two different other values so um uh, then you don't have um any entropy left and you need some sort of kind of uh, multi-call security that you can rely on from your primitive and i don't think that char3 has um Approve for this type of properties. Uh, 
Thank you. And now there is a question from Jonathan Holland to Watson. I don't know whether Jonathan wants to discuss it just in the chat or no, just in the chat. Can, can you hear me? Yes. Ah, okay. Um, yeah, I, I think the other key thing is that uh, SHA-3 can't be parallelized. So if you have 100,000 inputs, then uh, you would have to do it all A, then B, then C, rather than doing it in sets of trees and flexors. Ah, but but uh, Bob Moskowitz says it is parallelized. Yeah, I don't. I don't think this this question is um, so. So within the expand function, the expand function is usually implemented using the implementation of an HMAC. HMAC uses a hash function. I don't know what's currently uh, what's currently uh, supposed to be that hash function, but um, like supposing it's SHA three, then um, I, I think it might be used anyway. But um, but I, I'm not sure which hash function is currently supposed to be used in MLS. Yeah, but 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 anyway, this type of um, this type of uh, multi-call security is not uh, is um, is not something that I think SHA three has approved for. It would be an extremely exotic property to provide. Okay, thanks. Maybe if there is some discussion about KMAC and HMAC and C shake, it can be uh, moved to the mailing list. Uh, in fact, we have three minutes left. So thanks, Chris. We'll upload you. your, your PDF to the uh, meeting materials. So maybe any concluding comments from anyone, any other business? Very short. One, two, three. OK, thanks. So thanks, everyone. I uh, hope that we'll have some chance to meet in person soon. Uh, thank you very much. Have a nice meeting.